All right, everyone. So let's get started. So we have a couple of topics today. We're going to talk mostly about key value storage, uh, which is an emerging uh, technique for storing very large amounts of data, typically. So um, we'll talk about the API for key value, um, explain some of the implementation details and some of the challenges in getting really large scale key value stores to perform. And we're going to start the discussion of networking protocols um, and today just get into layering and the overall architecture of, of uh, communication protocols on the network. So these slides are heavily derived from um, slides earlier by Ion Stoika and Vern Paxson and Scott Schenker. So a key value store is conceptually very simple. You have a, a put operation that's indexed by a key and then a value that's being inserted in a table. Um, and the get operation is the inverse. You supply a key um, and if it's a key that's been stored in the table before, the value gets returned. So intuitively, it's just like a, a two column table. Um, and in fact, the, the point of the idea is to simplify the interface so that the implementation can be super efficient. So these are often used, in, increasingly used underneath very large scale databases. Um, they typically relax some of the consistency and other constraints of, of traditional databases. And they're used in various ways for sometimes for content addressable storage. So you can use keys which are quite complex that are actually really indexing into the content of a database. Um, <clears throat> and they've been scaled up to, to petabytes of data. And in fact, the most common really large data stores are almost always some flavor of key value store. And so those are distributed over hundreds or thousands or tens, actually probably hundreds of thousands of machines at the high end. Um, and they're designed to be faster with lower overhead for instance, I mean, there's different types of overhead in traditional relational databases. One of them is just the indexes um, that are often an order of magnitude bigger than the data itself. Um, but we'll see some of the other types of overhead that, that key value stores try to minimize. So in databases, you typically have four requirements, right? There's um, acid requirements, <coughs> which are atomicity, which is that every update should be in the form of, of a transaction. So either the whole change happens, all of the indices that are affected get updated or, or none of them. It's either no operation or a complete operation. Um, consistency means that the different tables that might be linking to each other have to be consistently set uh, and remain consistent throughout every transaction. Isolation implies that even when things are happening concurrently, that there's a simple sequential interpretation and that basically those complex updates are the same as some kind of serialization of the updates. Um, and finally, <coughs> um, the results of the transaction should be protected against various types of failure. So it has to be the case that somehow, for instance, if the, the data is heavily cached somewhere, uh, some machines go offline that the commits, if they were made, are still persisted somehow. Okay, so these properties guarantee that data, the data in traditional databases is highly protected um, and safe even after a variety of failures and basically arbitrary operations from clients. Um, so on the other hand, in distributed systems, it's been recognized that um, getting a lot of the desirable properties that you like in a distributed system, especially one that's highly responsive, is challenging and, in fact, impossible. Um, so th there's a related theorem called the CAP theorem <coughs> that applies to three similar concepts. Consistency, similar to consistency on the previous slide. When you have a distributed system, you want all of the nodes to have the, a consistent view of the data. Availability. Uh, it's somewhat of a new idea though, but it's critical for systems that are being used uh, to serve web content. And the idea is that when clients make requests, they should receive some kind of response, even if it's a response saying, I can't complete the transaction right now. 
Um, <coughs> and partition tolerance is uh, another kind of uh, fault tolerance or durability constraint that says that the system should continue even if there's a significant loss of, of storage. And so the idea was originally uh, defined, the, the conflict between these three things was defined by Eric Brewer uh, and in about 2000. And then a couple of years later, there was a theorem proved by some people at MIT that basically this is true under partic somewhat particular assumptions. But basically, you can't achieve all three of those at once. So it, that was Eric's original conjecture. Um, and in fact, it's, it's true under certain assumptions. So that means that <coughs> many of the systems that people actually build strive instead to uh, develop two of these, or they try to weaken um, one of the notions significantly. So they might strive for eventual consistency uh, instead of some stronger notion of a consistency at every time step. OK, so most key value stores are working under some relaxed assumptions that are often a subset of these. So there are CP systems that will have consistency and partition tolerance, et cetera. All right. <coughs> um, and just to clarify, you, you can map standard relational tables to key value stores. And in fact, that's, that's done. And there are some advantages to doing things that way. So in a traditional table, if you have some columns, <coughs> let's say states in the US, some IDs, uh, which uniquely identify them, um, let's say some data like population, area, square miles, uh, and one of the senators. So a tradi traditional database, there's an index which will index um, some row of the table. And the data is typically stored in rows. So you will retrieve an entire row. Um, <coughs> so there are actually two ways to approach this with a key value store. One of them is to break the table into columns with an index, which is the ID. And then your, um, your first column, which was the, the key of the original database, becomes the key of a key value table. And then the IDs thereafter become keys into the other, um, the other subtables, columns of the data. This way, you have simpler keys than if you use a complex key in every table. It'll be generally quicker to use a simpler key. Um, and we've done two things here. We've broken this original table into simpler tables. Um, and we've also made access to the data easier if we only want certain fields. So <coughs> um, yeah, and in addition, we can, if we want to have other indices, we can just add them as separate uh, key value stores. And for instance, if you want to index by, by senator, you can add that key value store, and you'll have basically a table with two indices now. Um, so performance-wise, this gives you a, excuse me, a column-based store, which contrasts with traditional databases that are normally stored row-based. All right, and the advantage of that is in a lot of databases, especially actually internet databases, will often have hundreds of columns, um, and a lot of queries will in index just a couple of those. And using a col columnar format allows you to be a lot more selective and a lot more efficient in accessing the data. So a lot of newer systems do use column-based storage. And under the hood, they'll have uh, perhaps a highly efficient key value store implementing the column store. So that's one approach of um, representing large relational tables is to break them into column stores. Um, the other approach is to just keep the contents of each row uh, together and just form a complex value out of it. So that approach is also used as well. Um, and here are some examples. So here, here are some canonical uh, users of large tables, all the internet companies. So Amazon uh, has very complex customer records <coughs> um, indexed by a customer ID. And then uh, the values comprise a, a long record of all of the different customer information. Um, Facebook and Twitter use a similar thing. <coughs> These are used by uh, simple, unique uh, identifiers. You can also access uh, things like iTunes storage by song name. Um, and in um, distributed file systems, key value stores are used in a few different ways. Um, HDFS really has two different levels of key value store. 
uh, one of which is mapping file names to nodes that host um, copies of the file or replicas of the file. And then on each data node, there's in addition mappings from uh, IDs of pieces of the file to specific addresses on the file. So we'll get a bit more into that. might be confusing right now. We'll get more into that um, implementation later on. All right. And uh, a couple more, or a few more. <coughs> Google's file system and the Hadoop file system, which is modeled after Google's file system, um, as I mentioned, has these two different labels, layers of key value store. Um, Amazon uses a variety of key value stores. Bigtable and HBase are um, uh, somewhat customized key value stores, again, in a key value format. You can layer on richer structures to represent relational data with those. Um, <coughs> Facebook has their own system, Cassandra. And <coughs> Memcached is a popular in-memory key value store that's used for a variety of, uh, of purposes for caching and um, holding, uh, acting as a cache for in conjunction with larger and complex data stores. Um, and there are also complex peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, key value stores, eDonk and eMule, and also BitTorrent's an example of that. All right, so any questions so far? Yep. Uh, so BitTorrent has basically a, a, a file, it has, let's see, Let's see, it has two levels. It has a search engine which uh, you have to first of all query to get, um, yeah, BitTorrent has a dist BitTorrent has actually a distributed um, file uh, directory. So um, let's see, I think it starts with a global lookup. Um, you have to contact a peer which has a piece of the distributed table um, so there's basically multiple key value stores which are parts of a directory um, that, that it uses. So it's really, uh, it's actually one level more complex than, than what we've been describing because you have to first of all find a directory that has uh, an object that you're looking for and then look up the object and then try to find the files um, which are typically replicated on a few different places. All right, so... Um, so a key value store is also called a distributed hash table. And uh, the idea is to be able to store the set of key value pairs um, and actually keep the storage across many machines. And right now the directory will be on one machine. Later on we'll figure out how to try to distribute the directory as well. So conceptually we have a single key value table and the actual pieces of it are going to be distributed across machines like this. Um, we're also going to have to use replication so that we can have robustness against failures. So we want to make sure that failures don't cause the data to be lost and that don't have too big an impact on running time. All right, so because realistically the scales we're operating at with thousands of machines the probability of failures is, is quite high. They'll be happening every few weeks. Um, and sometimes there'll be catastrophic failures of, of entire racks of machines. So it's a given that failures will happen. We have to make sure that we have a response that will hopefully keep the system fully functional um, of those problems. Um, we also want to maintain consistency, which means uh, making sure that, that when there are replicas that they're consistent with each other, and if there are messages um, being passed around in the system that they're consistent with each other as much as possible. Let's see. So um, across the different systems that we're considering, say from memcached through to really large peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, the latencies range from quite small latencies uh, to access data from fast local storage through to thousands of milliseconds to seconds to access it across the network. And bandwidth similarly varies from tens of kilobits through several gigabits if we're talking about the net bandwidth across a large distributed store. Yeah, question? Uh, 
Um, I think I understand. So your question is, is like a reference copy of the data somewhere versus is one version of the data the reference copy versus replicas? Right. Yeah, there's normally no distinction between the replicas, and normally the, the master or directory node is deciding where to put things. So it, it receives one copy and then decides where to put replicas. So yeah, there's a symmetry between the replicas. Um, there's normally no asymmetry either when things are retrieved. Normally it'll send requests to all the machines at once, and whichever one comes back is the one that's used. All right. Okay, so... Um, we have these simple operations that we want to uh, execute, but we have a lot of degrees of freedom because it's a big distributed system. Okay. Um, and we want to, at the same time as keeping this simple interface, make sure that we have a lot of robustness built into the system. So the simplest way to do this is to maintain um, a master directory that's keeping track of where the different values are stored and nodes uh, then can directly query that, query that master node. They only need the address of the master. Um, they can send a request to the master to save something. The master, let's say, already has some information about what's in the distributed store right now. So it's got a couple of elements, and you can see that it's storing um, the key and then a machine number. And then the value itself is on that machine number indexed by the key. So a new re re request comes in to put this value V14. Um, the master at that time determines a mapping to a machine that's going to hold that value. Now that mapping is uh, quite complex and dynamic, and this node here can decide based on what machines have the most available storage, which ones are loaded, and so on, um, where it's going to put that piece of data. So then it actually pushes it to some node, and it will appear in the key value store for that particular node. And then when something else comes, when another machine requests that data, um, it's now, at least the machine address is in the master directory. The master directory can forward the request in this setup. Um, the data will come back to the master in that situation and go back to the requesting node. So. The, uh, in this version of the key value store, the client never actually figured out where the data was stored. Um, everything was forwarded through the master. So that's called a recursive query, and there's obviously some scalability difficulties with that. Right? Because if we have thousands of queries per second, they're all going through the master directory. Key values excuse me, keys are often small, values are generally large, so that's a lot of bandwidth going through that node. Um, all the master actually has is this machine number, so it can also send that back directly to the requesting machine. Um, so now um, the requester actually has the location of the data, or at least it has the machine address, and it can forward the request directly to the machine that it's looking for, um, which would do the save. And we've, we've completed the transaction with a lot less communication through the master. Um, <clears throat> now the data is there. So if another node requests it, this node also receives the machine name. And it can go dire directly to that machine to retrieve the data. So it's a more scalable approach um, to updating and querying. Uh, and we can look at some of the trade-offs. Here's the two scenarios now again. Um, the iterative algorithm, excuse me, the recursive algorithm always goes through the master directory node um, and forwards the request, receives it, and sends it back. The iterative version um, directory only sends a machine name, uh, well, an IP address. Then the client node sends the request directly to that machine, gets back the result. So the recursive version, it's typically faster in terms of latency because um, 
this key value store is going to be implemented normally in a data center where the master node is physically close to all of the data nodes. So the network time for this uh, communication across here is, in terms of latency, is very short. Um, compared to an iterative scheme, you've still got these two messages here, the get with the key and the value being returned. Those are the same in both cases. Um, but here we've got a communication across a short data, data node network versus through the internet. So generally you'll get better latency uh, with the recursive scheme. But it has this big disadvantage, which is that um, there's a scalability problem because all the values are going through the directory. Um, but another advantage of the recursive scheme is that um, we have this notion of consistency, which is much easier to check if requests are all going through the master. And in fact, the order of, the, of all of the uh, interactions is going to be visible on the master. And if you choose, you can force serialization of those, basically force um, updates to happen in a particular order. Um, because basically everybody has to go through this master node. So the master node really has the reference picture of what the state of the world is. Um, okay, so the iterative query it, though is more scalable because we're moving the heavy traffic, the value traffic directly from data nodes to clients. Um, <clears throat> the disadvantage is it's generally going to be a bit slower because those clients are further in the network topology from the data nodes. And, you know, once we give an address to a, a client here, um, we've really lost track of the order in which steps might be happening uh, between clients and data nodes. So it's potentially much harder to figure out what the state of this, the distributed data store is. All right, so <clears throat> um, since it is really important to have fault tolerance, the uh, approach is always to replicate the data on several nodes. And in fact, for best protection, um, the safest thing is to replicate them on different racks uh, in a data center so that if there's a power failure in one rack or a, a, a network switch failure, that that only affects one replica. All right, so here we have the same setup as before. We've got um, a couple of values in the distributed store. So now we're going to insert a new value. <coughs> and this time, because we've asked for replication for this value, the directory node's going to return two, or at least, yeah, it's going to return two uh, node values back to the client. And the client's going to simply, well, it'll happen in one of two ways. In this, si this situation, the data node itself has forwarded the, um, the put request to a different location. Um, and actually, this would be, this really should have an entry um, because this node needs to know which is the second node to forward to. Um, but anyway, so here we've got, we've made the data node responsible for, for making a second replica. So this is a recursive version of the replicated update. Um, this might be a little bit confusing because it's got an iterative query of the uh, master directory, which is the default. Normally most systems will do that to save bandwidth on the server. Once we've done that though, we, it's recursive in the sense that um, there's one request sent to the data node and the data node recursively forwards that request somewhere else. Um, okay, so that's the analog of the recursive query that we saw before. Uh, there's an iterative version, and in the iter iterative version, the client interacts directly with both of the replicas. So it starts out the same. <coughs> the data node returns the two machines that the client should interact with, and this time the client just sends more or less simultaneously um, the two replicas. But at query time, there's, there's really no difference. So, you know, actually, let's go back. At query time, if we do a, a, a get query, the get query will normally go to the two nodes. Whichever one returns first will, um, will be the answer that's used. 
Okay, so um, so we we're using replication. Um, we, it does require somewhat more nodes, um, but the benefit is it's requiring it's providing us with a system that's both robust against failures um, and it's highly available. So with replication, we get the system staying up even get, uh, if there are significant failures. Um, and the throughput can be very high as well. We can benefit actually uh, from having these multiple copies. First of all, <clears throat> in the example so far, we're assuming that a values, values are coming back atomically. Um, so basically, we can have a race between replicas to see who is going to return first. Another thing we can do, excuse me, is to break up large values such as files themselves or any kind of large record into smaller blocks and then distribute them across machines. So here we're using the distributed file store, something like a RAID, and basically effectively striping a really large value across different nodes. Um, so HDFS does this, the Hadoop file system does this. Uh, large files are broken up into basic blocks. They're pretty big, maybe 100 megabytes or so, but those blocks are distributed then across machines. Um, if you really want a, a copy of that file very quickly, then all of the nodes that have a piece can send it to you at the same time. So potentially you can have really big th uh, throughput benefits from partitioning and distributing and replicating. Yeah. All right, that's a really good question. I, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, you have to provide for the case that the entry that the client has is out of date. You would, I, I think you would have to provide some, some kind of default timeout to make sure it doesn't use that data when the data is no longer there. Um, by default, um, these systems are set up to uh, move data, at least add replicas and generally move data. So at some point probably there are copies that are bad. Um, whether, whether that requires you to, so I, I think it's up to the algorithm to decide whether you basically that handle needs to be voided with some sort of message to the client or it's a timeout or if the client simply uses a bad, a bad handle and finds out that the data is not there. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think there's, there's several different ways that can be handled and I think it's up to the system. But it's, it's a good question though. It definitely there's an issue. Normally though the requests are not being used for really long periods of time. They're normally being used in the context of a transaction. So they should have a short lifetime. All right, so, um, so we have, so far we have a, a hotspot <coughs> in the master directory which is we're relying on, even if we don't rely on it to directly forward uh, values, we do rely on it to provide the directory into all of its storage. So if the master uh, goes offline, then we've lost the whole data set. So it's very important to have an a, ability to replicate the master as well. Um, and that's the simplest solution. It adds more complexity to making the system uh, consistent though it was even more important for um, directly rep directory replicas to stay consistent. Um, and another scheme that again um, has a throughput advantage is to partition the directory so that different keys are stored in different servers. And that way you at least maintain, even if it's not replicated, you maintain a fairly high availability of storage. So, um, a lot of search engines use a scheme that partitions their indices without necessarily having replication, at least the early ones did. Um, 
So they use partitioning of the indices so that with high probability you still uh, retrieve a given entry, a given search hit. In fact, for search hits, because there's a long list of search hits, um, for the same key just stored on different machines, all that would happen would be a few of the hits would be missing and people generally didn't notice. But um, at, for the last assignment, last project, um, you'll actually be looking at peer-to-peer uh, -peer distributed hash tables which use partitioning of the directory structure so that um, basically you have a high availability index that has high throughput and relatively good um, robustness. All right, so, um, so a few more issues with this slide scale data store. Uh, load balancing is important. It's important that your reads and writes are being roughly evenly distributed across the data nodes. Um, one way to deal with that is that the, the master directory node, since it's seeing all of the queries, it can see the distribution of queries versus machines. Um, and assuming it's also aware of the storage that's available on machines, um, it can allocate new values to nodes that have the available storage on them. Now, when we add a new node, um, the simplest solution would be starting to add values on the new node, but why would that be bad? Yeah. Right. You, you, yeah, there's a very high probability of overloading that. Assuming client programs have temporal and spatial locality, there's a good chance when you have one hit on a, a certain datum or on a set of new values, you're likely to have a lot more hits on those new values. All right, that's good. And you know, another issue, well, is that we already have heavy load on, a, on particular nodes in the network, so this is an opportunity uh, to actually decrease the load and improve the performance of existing nodes by moving things, yeah? I, okay, so I'm not, I didn't follow the question. If you had. Well, um, I, there might be scenarios where it would help, but usually it doesn't help because usually you're uh, limited by the network bandwidth more so than, um, say, disk bandwidth especially if, these, if the data nodes are serving multiple queries at the same time, you typically have a pretty small slice of each straw. So by having pieces of the data similar to a RAID, if you have little pieces of a large data set distributed, then the speed at which it comes at you is um, the aggregate. So, so I, think, I think what you're thinking of is, uh, is probably latency. I mean, the time to access the first record from each machine is, is sort of fixed, say 10 milliseconds. If you had a really small amount of data, what you're saying is true. If you wanted to get a little bit of data, it's kind of wasteful to stripe uh, small amounts of data across machines because you'll have that same, um, that same uh, latency for each machine and the overhead of sort of thrashing and trying to retrieve a, a small data. So yes, if it's a small block of data, then it's best to be on one machine. So yes, I guess that if you have uh, if you have values that are small, yes, it would make sense to at least block them a little bit to have them on one machine because they probably will be accessed uh, close together. But for larger loads, it's better to distribute. You know, and that's how most systems block. They block in um, blocks. Say HDFS blocks in blocks of about 100 megabytes, which uh, you know is significantly larger than latency of a disk. So, um, yeah, so for most cases it is useful to distribute the, the larger size blocks to get maximum throughput. All right, so uh, when a node fails, um, so if a single node fails, the replicas of things that were on that node should be on different nodes and probably on different racks. So we need to take the replicas and replicate them again to reproduce the redundancy that the, the failed node had so, um, so that's a task that the, in the simplest case, the master directory will be responsible for that. It'll have a list of all the things on that uh, dead node. It'll have to then sort of distribute those, again, based on load to other nodes, and then cause the data nodes to actually do the copying. 
All right, so there's some specific uh, replication challenges that we should talk about uh, right now. So we want to make sure that when we replicate, we get a, a valid copy on each node. Um, so when data is pushed to a node, for the server to know that it's actually being received and saved, there's an acknowledgement that happens. And we have to worry about the fact that the, the update happens, the, but the, um, the node may actually fail during that op operation. So what we can do is, is try again, repeat the replication, because, there's, uh, because the data node is doing this dynamically, one of the things it can factor into is just non-response from a, a data node. So we can simply pick a node and try it again. Um, it's more complicated if the node is, is slow. That's going to imply that the put operation that's supposed to create enough replicas is actually going to uh, have to continue until it's got acknowledgments from a, a certain critical number of nodes. So anyway, these are the choices you have to make as a designer. You can either try to ex extend the timeout and wait or just pick another node and possibly end up with an um, overload of replicas. All right, so <coughs> in general, because you have to wait for the replicas to happen and be acknowledged, um, put operations are slower. It's really a, a max, some kind of max of the operations that you do. Gets, on the other hand, are really a min of the nodes that you can retrieve. So as soon as you send out, once you have the directory information about where the data is, you can send out requests to all those data nodes in parallel. And whichever one arrives first is going to give you the answer. So uh, GET in general is a minimizer of, of delay and latency, and BUT is still a maximizer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so typically you won't discover that until uh, you request. That's a difficult case, right? A node's going dark, so probably you're not going to ping um, for specific copies of data, but you may ping, you'll often ping nodes for just basically the node being up. So, um, yeah, so most of the time if the node goes dark, you'll find that out and then create replica copies. Um, it is possible that, that there was a disk error. That's kind of a nasty case. So you wouldn't normally discover that until you try to retrieve the data. Um, okay, so, <coughs> all right, so let's look at consistency now. So how close can um, a distributed system emulate a single machine in terms of the read and write semantics? Okay, so suppose we have a, an insertion, we're trying to put, insert a couple of values with the same key, uh, K14, what will happen? <coughs> well, if we've built the system so that uh, the put is indeed atomic, we should end up with either um, a V14 primed or a double primed. Um, another case is if we do a put to the, even to the same data node and then a get operation, we would expect to, do, to um, get the result that we most recently put in. But that, is, in fact, isn't, uh, isn't what will always happen. So if you actually trace through some real systems, it's, uh, it's actually quite hard to achieve this. So let's just look at some, some examples of what can go wrong. And this slide always skips. Um, so let's look at what happens when, we, when some of these um, updates arrive at about the same time. All right, so here's our directory, um, and here's the state that it's in now. It's got a couple of replicas of um, K14 right now. So there's an old value of, K of uh, V14 in these two nodes here. And we're going to update that value. First request comes in here. And then another one comes in almost at the same time. So the update hasn't happened yet uh, before we get another request. Potentially, um, in a recursive system, the requests might be forwarded uh, in a different order. I mean, 
most likely they'd be forwarded in the same order, but the network itself may have additional latencies. So assuming K4, uh, V14 came in first, that would be the, um, the first message to arrive here, but if there's some e extra network latency, it, it might not arrive first at the other machine. So now you've got two machines, they've actually received the two copies in a different order. So on each node, um, sorry, on each node you can see that you'll have the last value received, but they're not consistent. So unfortunately, um, <coughs> in this case, the, the, for this particular setup, we've defined a really simple system that's gonna have an undefined response. So clearly we have to do something else um, probably some extra kinds of acknowledgements to make sure that, that these, this situation can't happen. All right, so, so in other words, we've seen so far that with a simple setup, we're not guaranteed, with replication, we're not guaranteed to get back the last write. Um, and our master directory, by using parallelism, trying to speed things up, actually created an ordering problem. If it had worked, if it had operated truly in a serial fashion, that would have not happened. It would have had to have sent out each request, waited for an acknowledgement, and that would have avoided the problem. All right, so, <coughs> so you can see in this case, um, if we, you know, here's the, the get request coming in for that T now, um, and it's gonna retrieve the most recent value here. Uh, in this case, we have the request, the get request actually coming in before the put request. Um, again, most likely they went out in the right order, but then the network introduced an additional delay on the put. So in fact, we've retrieved um, the old data before the new data was ever inserted. So yeah, so we get back the old value. So you can see that um, because of delays, there's a lot of problems that can happen. And at least you probably get a taste of why it's the easiest way to actually make this all work is to enforce sequential consistency, enforce the operations to actually happen and complete um, atomically before uh, trying to do the next operation. But the trouble is that if you did that, the system's going to become incredibly slow. Um, that data node's gonna be receiving requests from probably thousands of clients. So, you know, we have to find ways of um, allowing for concurrency, but at the same time, protecting consistency, which is a real challenge. All right, so the atomic consistency, which is what we want, is, is easy to achieve, but the big sacrifice is we have to do the operations one at a time. Um, so we, in fact, usually we'll do something that's less safe, that's fast. Later on in the class, we'll actually talk in detail about transactions, which are um, processes that make sure, that basically guarantee uh, consistency and completeness uh, through all of the updates that we do. All right, <coughs> so um, what we saw in this example too was that we ended up with an inconsistent state, two of the nodes uh, with a different value being stored. Um, so one kind of trade-off that you can make is instead of trying to serialize things and make, them, make things really slow, is to strive in instead for eventual consistency. So where you do have replicas that are potentially different, um, the master directory di discovers that when it does the, the get request. Since you have that consistency, it can resolve, the, it, can resolve it, but uh, it'll take a little bit longer to do that. It'll have to make a policy decision about which one to keep and then propagate that back to the other replicas. Um, that's a common strategy that's used is uh, backing off from instantaneous consistency, allowing some inconsistencies to get into the system and basically resolving them later on. So it gives you a way to get good performance most of the time and hopefully not too many conflicts. Um, well, there's a variety of other strategies that are used that are, uh, uh, provide different stronger or weaker uh, types of consistency. So, all right. So strong consistency, we, we described this already. It's basically the idea of, of ser serializing all of the updates. Um, it has serious performance consequences, which are you're basically losing your parallelism 
um, but it does at least guarantee everything's consistent because all of the copies are being re uh, updated before you can do another transaction. Yeah. I mean, um, it should be of the order of seconds because it's really enough time for a, a, the master directory to do a, some resolution and changes to propagate through the system. So not, not a huge amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, the client would have to notify, presumably notify the master that there was inconsistency and then uh, the master would be responsible for resolving it, yeah. All right. So um, an, an, interesting, um, an interesting approach to, to getting consistency relatively efficiently uh, is called quorum consensus. Both fast and reliably is called quorum consistent consensus, excuse me. So, um, it, and it balances the costs of doing the put and the get. So, assuming we have a replica set of size n, uh, the put operation is going to, you know, push the replicas to all of the n data nodes in the replica set, but it's only going to wait for acknowledgments from a subset of W. So, W is generally less than n, maybe about half of n, uh, and then get is going to wait for responses from some number R of replicas that's also maybe about half of N. And what happens if W plus R is greater than N? What's guaranteed if the number of acknowledging nodes and the number of replicas in total is greater than N? What can you say? Yeah. Yeah, at least it's a it's a pigeonholing question. So at least one um, at least one node both uh, received and acknowledged the write request and also responded to the read request. So it produced the um, the most up to date copy. And hopefully, if there's a way to recognize that that is the most up to date copy, that'll be the one that's used. Okay, so um, <coughs> right, so we're guaranteed with this numbering that that. One node actually did receive the update and, and also responded to the read request. Okay, so that's a simple model. All right, here's an example. <coughs> we have a three way replication uh, and a write threshold of two and a read threshold of two as well. And we're replicating on these three nodes N1, N3, and N4. And let's assume one of the operations fails. So the write to N3 doesn't where uh, then the other two nodes, though, those should acknowledge uh, that the operation succeeded. All right, so now issuing a get. So the data is missing from the middle node, <coughs> but it is on the other two. Now, well, let's assume the request went to all three, to just two of them respond. And even if the dead node responds, or the node that didn't do the update, um, because one node is in both sets, this node in this case was both a receiver um, of the update and also a responder, uh, we guaranteed that that one gives the correct response back to the <coughs> client or master. All right, so things worked out. We were guaranteed always by the numbering that as long as there's two responses, one of them will be good. Okay, yep. So, all right, so you're asking if, if the network was pathological enough, if all the get requests went out before the put requests were acknowledged. Yeah, so in that case, we, let's see, what have we done? Well, uh, so I, I, we, if the, literally the get requests, even if they're going out through the network, and if we have a quorum of read requests, 
uh, we do have consistency in the sense that you get a copy of the data before the updates happen. Remember, we're trying for consistency, not necessarily for uh, maximum availability or maximum updates, right? So it's plausible that all the updates simply, you know, yeah, if, they, if they're happening later for normal reasons, then at least the value that's going back is consistent. So that's, that's all we can do in that situation, yeah? Well, if, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I think that's true. If it's, well, of course, if it's, um, yeah, but if we're w running in the sequential mode, then the master node uh, is not actually uh, doing the updates, let me see. Yes, so, right. So in this case, I mean, yeah, the master node should not be allowing requests if it receives them after it's doing, um, yeah, this is really only gonna work on a master node as it's described. If the master node receives those requests later, it should block waiting for at least um, W of the updates. The trickier problem is if the updates are happening directly from the data node. But then um, I think we would need, I mean, I think the master node has to be in the loop here uh, measuring these read and write counts. Otherwise, there's no way it can determine. Uh, because for instance, the, um, actually let me think. Yeah, I, th I think it's sensible to wait, assuming the same node is actually doing the updates. The tricky question is if there's a different node trying to, do to read. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's pretty clear if, if there isn't somebody deciding that there's a critic, the, the constraint is met of the minimum number of, of right acknowledgements, then this can't work. So, um, yeah, let me get back to you on that. I better figure out what the right solution is. All right. All right, so anyway, so we have, um, uh, we, so we have one simplified version which we just presented of, um, uh, of uh, ap achieving approximate consistency by looking for a consensus among the data nodes. Um, the other, but we saw before that that there are a lot of challenges to, to getting consistency um, if we want replication and if we want availability at the same time. So um, this is one model, there's a lot of other consistent models. Um, Anyway, let's look at what we've learned so far and try to, uh, uh, actually I'll do a quiz, I'll do the quiz right after the break. Um, some quick reminders, the uh, project two code is due on Thursday, uh, Thursday midnight, so please uh, keep that in mind. The uh, submissions are coming in pretty slowly right now. Um, there's not a lot of time. It should be a pretty easy assignment, but please try to not waste um, slip days, yeah. So if you have a, if you have received back enough copies, then um, the quorum algorithm guarantees that they're at least consistent. So whether uh, you've received you may have received an older copy as well, so partly it's, there are timestamps you can use to decide which one is the most current value. Um, but other than that, um, no, I think that's the best you can get out of that. Um, anyway, so, uh, sorry, we have project two code due on Thursday, project code group evals are due on Friday. Please try to use, not use your slip days for this one. There are a couple of challenging projects coming up later in the semester. 
um, that are going to take a lot of time. There are only four slip days, remember, and after that, we'll start deducting 10 points for each day late. So please try to get them in soon. Yeah? Say that a bit louder. I'm sorry, what, if you submit your what? I don't think we're taking it off for a group of ours, no. All right. Okay, so let's take a, a five-minute break.
Okay, <laughs> let's continue. So let's review some of the ideas um, about key value stores and about consistency generally. So first of all, distributed key value stores, should they always be consistent, available, and partition tolerant? Yes or no? Should, <laughs> all right, should but can't, all right, fair enough. Right, um, yeah, unfortunately we can't do that, and that's the cap theorem. Um, on a single node, a key value store can be implemented by a hash table. True, yeah, it's basically, it's a distributed hash table, so yeah, the hash table works on one node. Um, a master can be a bottleneck, yeah. Um, let's see, an iterative puts achieve lower throughput than recursive puts. Yeah, opposite, good, all right. Um, and with quorum consensus, we can improve read performance at the expense of write performance. Well, so actually we, we are um, allowing the system to um, still work with a limited number of reads. Um, so uh, there, are, there is a read benefit, but um, uh, there is also an additional expense in writing. All right, so we're gonna change topics now and look at uh, network protocols for a while. So the next few lectures are gonna be about, <coughs> about networking and um, IP protocols. So at high level, let's review what a protocol is. So a protocol is an agreement on how to communicate. So it includes a syntax layer, which is how the communication is specified, what specific uh, fields then have to be in the communication, um, how records are organized, and so on. The order in which things are received and sent. And then there's the semantics, which has to do with the things that should happen um, during the protocol. Um, and it also relates to the meaning of certain fields like um, uh, encodings, byte orders, and so on. So those are the two elements. You know, we have protocols in most things that we do. Whenever there's uh, different agents trying to coordinate their activities, they often use a protocol. So on the telephone, if you pick up um, and answer the phone, you listen for a dial tone, make sure you have service, Dial a number, wait for the ringtone, um, somebody says hello, and either you say, hi, it's me, or hi, it's John. Um, and then you dive into the conversation. You always pause to wait for somebody to respond. And they talk and pause. And eventually, blah, 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 um, you finish the call. And everyone says bye, and that's uh, an acknowledgement that you finished the conversation. All right, um, <clears throat> in the classroom when you wanna ask a question, you start by raising your hand normally. Um, you, if the instructor's in the middle of talking about something, you, you wait for that transaction to finish and then get called on. Uh, if it's not a structured situation, if it's just a regular meeting, then you'll often just wait for a pause in the conversation, interject what you wanna say and continue. Okay, so, um, in internet communication, you have a variety of different clients and services. We have PCs, now um, mobile phones, smartphones, and then larger computers normally that are providing services, um, typically known as hosts. So a client program um, is something running on a, a user's host, requests a service, and uh, say a get request from an HTTP server, requests a specific document, the server program is also running on another IP host, uh, provides the service and implements, say, a web server, which is a large protocol for responding to, to queries. In this case, the, the site's not available. Come back again later. Um, so client programs are assumed to be sometimes available. Um, the server is expected to be highly available. Clients normally initiate requests to a server for some operation that they're interested in, 
um, servers are expected to be running all the time and serving requests continuously. Um, clients have a lot of difficulty communicating with each other. Uh, they do it sometimes when typically through a server though. Um, um, on the other side of things, servers don't normally initiate communication with a few exceptions. They wait for a request from clients. Um, in order to use a server, a client has to have somehow an address for that server. Uh, it can be an IP address or a web site URL that's received through the web or through a search engine. Um, and for that to work, there must be a, a stable mapping from a symbolic name to the address of the server. All right, so um, there are also peer-to-peer -peer protocols um, where uh, essentially clients are communicating with each other. It requires some minimal amount of, of uh, directory information for each peer to find another peer. But um, once that communication is initiated, um, the connection is, is set up, but it has to be dynamically managed as clients change addresses. So there's a directory structure that's often distributed and dynamic that allows clients to move around. So every time you reconnect, and even if you uh, change addresses, if you're moving around with a phone, potentially that can happen, um, you'll maintain the connection because the directories will update. So an example of this is, is BitTorrent. So any host can request files, send files or run a query, um, and also warehouse some fraction of the data. So um, this kind of scale is provided by uh, millions of peers, and there's no boundary now in this sort of system between clients and servers. Each node is hosting some of the content, providing some of the services, um, but also typically uh, retrieving stuff from its owner, for its owner. Okay, so um, we have a lot of these different types of application that people would like to run on the internet and a lot of different physical networking layers as well. We have wireless, um, uh, a couple of different wired protocols now. Uh, optical network is starting to resurface again. Um, it's always been an important part of uh, data centers, but now becoming important for uh, end user networking as the network speeds creep up beyond a gigabit. So we have all these different application layers and network layers, and it creates a potential N squared problem, which is that <coughs> every time we add a new kind of high level service, we need to w make that interoperate with all of the low level services that we have, all of the physical media for transmission. And similarly, if we added a new um, network uh, transport layer, like a different type of radio, then that has to be linked back up to um, all of the high level services that people might want to run. So it's a quadratic blow up. We don't want to really have to do that. So how does the internet address this? Um, we rely heavily on a layering approach where the communication is, this, is a multi-layered uh, set of protocols. The high-level application layers only have to communicate with the top layer of that stack. The physical media, media similarly are only communicating with the bottom layer. And there's additional partitioning between the layers in order to prevent uh, this kind of quadratic complexity effect, in effect happening inside of the protocol stack. All right, so that's, yeah, and in this, this setup, when we add a, a new high-level protocol, we only have to figure out ways of making it interoperate with the next layer down in the protocol stack, or if we add a new physical transport, we only have to make it interoperate with the bottom of the stack. So now we've made everything linear um, and a lot simpler and a lot more scalable. All right, so... Um, just as we partition complex software systems into modules um, and define their uh, interfaces and separate the interfaces from implementation, um, product internet protocols do the same thing. 
the interfaces give you flexibility in how you actually implement the protocols underneath um, and allow you easily to add modules on the top. The modules only need to know about this limited set of uh, functionalities of methods effectively to call in order to do what they want to do. Um, <coughs> so uh, libraries do a very similar thing, which is they, prevent, they present specific APIs at high level for a programmer and they can change their implementation, become more efficient uh, without adding any extra burden. In fact, just continuing to run with client code. So similarly, um, in the internet, those ki similar kinds of interfaces, those um, basically protocol APIs allow people to implement their applications just one time. There can be a lot of evolution in the network. So um, there are new uh, lower level transport uh, protocols being used for some of the faster optical networking layers. But, pro but nobody sees that at the application layer. So generally this is a good thing. Hiding these layers of abstraction is a good thing. Um, but there is a performance penalty because it means that the low level transport layers are not aware of what kinds of bits are flowing over them. And there is a big difference between um, say text content that's being streamed from a website that's basically HTML content and um, say uh, real video or some other kind of video stream uh, which isn't as easily partitioned where the latency is extremely important for the experience of watching the video and the internet protocols mostly hide those differences. Um, so there are you know, great advantages in terms of simplicity, but there's often performance penalties for having a simple and universal protocol stack. All right, so <coughs> um, some decisions we have to make. Uh, there are two main principles. One of them is breaking this complex uh, set of protocols into different layers so that we can go progressively from a very high level of abstraction say for HTTP that just specifies the syntax and semantics of what uh, HTML pages are all the way down to the encoding of it, uh, Ethernet packets at the network layer. So to ease that transition we have a layered approach. And another important principle for the simplicity of the network is called the end-to-end -end principle. And that says that you shouldn't put any state or parameters into the network um, unless you really have to. And especially if you can move that functionality, let's say some error recovery functionality into the endpoint, you should do that instead of trying to make the protocol itself more complex. So the end-to-end -to -end principle is about, um, it's sort of complementary to layering. Layering says, you know, keep things simple by having simple APIs and a progression of abstraction, end-to-end -end is just sort of keep the network itself simple and use application level stuff as you can. So we'll see a bit more of that next time. That's the subject of the next lecture. All right, so layering, <coughs> um, it's a simple idea, simple to explain anyway. So basically, the idea is that every layer should solely um, rely on services from the layer be below. So from the Ethernet layer, you have uh, basically um, layers that implement particular styles of packets, either UDP or um, TCP IP packets. And at the top level, um, you should, uh, sorry, at, the, at each level, you should only export services to a layer above. So you only are allowed to drop down one level or move up one level in the layering. So there's a well-defined interface between the layers um, that helps hide the implementation details and it allows people to optimize each layer um, without disturbing the interfaces of other layers. All right, so protocol standardization is a way of um, ensuring that, that all of the hosts speak the same protocol. Um, <coughs> That allows you to uh, implement different layers in different ways. Um, if you don't do that, you're relying on 
a few expert programmers to do all of the work. Um, and that does happen sometimes, but, but mostly uh, the internet's been driven by standards that have been involved by a large number of actors. It's a slow process because of the large number of actors involved. It usually goes through an extended request for comments where tentative standards are proposed and then um, all of the companies that have a stake in what these protocols might do can weigh in, provide um, their input until the standards eventually uh, codified and becomes uh, a, 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 a internet standard. And the organization that manages this is the IETF. And you can see actually the history of the RFCs at this location here. So you can really get an idea of how much complexity goes into designing these protocols. All right. Um, on the other hand, there are some de facto standards. Um, Skype and BitTorrent are just basically systems that people wrote. Um, and other systems interoperate with those systems essentially uh, by, by trial and error or by agreement with the developers of the original code. All right, so um, quickly there are two different uh, types of transport, two important different types of transport on, over the internet. The first one is datagram transport. Um, the idea is to make a best effort at uh, delivering packets the, uh, each packet <coughs> contains some amount of data and a header that specifies the information about where it's the, the source, where it should be going, um, something about the content. And it provides only the weakest kind of service. The, the packets mostly arrive quickly, but there's no guarantee that it arrives at all. Um, a lot of guarantees are not provided, such as packets might be lost, they might be corrupted, or they might be delivered out of order. Um, by contrast, TCP is a robust layer which uh, provides an ordered reliable byte stream and simultaneous transmission in both directions. Um, it relies on retransmit, so TCP provides an abstraction of reliable transmission by um, relying on acknowledgments for packets that are sent and retransmission in order to produce the right output. Um, it also, at the receiving end, because there may be retransmits that are actually unnecessary, it discards duplicate packets and also takes packets that might have been received out of order and puts them back in the right order. Um, <coughs> and there's two high-level control mechanisms that are layered on top of that acknowledgement system. The first one is flow control, um, which the sender implements by looking at acknowledgements from the receiver typically, uh, noticing that there is a lagging, starting to lag, suggesting that receiver is not ready to receive more information, um, and potentially slowing down its transmission, or at least waiting for the acknowledgements before sending more information. Um, and congestion control, which involves the sender typically figuring out somehow that the network is congested. And that's going to involve um, sensing that packets, that, that acknowledgement packets are just being lost so that there's loss either of the acknowledgement or the original packet, which implies a heavy network load. So both of those um, adjustments are made typically slowly by observing the behavior of the network over a period of time. But um, almost all implementations of TCP include those, those mechanisms. All right. So very quickly, um, before we go, protocols specify syntax and semantics. True or false? True, OK. All right. Protocols specify implementation. False, OK. Layering helps to improve application performance. False, all right, awesome. OK, best effort packet delivery. Ensures packets are delivered in order. All right. Um, P2P systems are known as both a client and a server. Great. All right. And TCP ensures each packet is delivered with a predefined amount of time. False. False. All right. Excellent. Okay. All right. Good job. See you next time.